Hello, I'm Dr. Lisa Belial, and you are watching or listening to our video podcast, Radio Maine, where we celebrate creativity and the human spirit. And we are sponsored by the Portland Art Gallery in Portland, Maine. Today, to help us celebrate, I think, more the, the human spirit, but also he's certainly a very creative individual in his own right, is Dr. Nick Gallagher, who is the medical director of addiction medicine at a local Maine health organization. And he is currently there helping with some of our Mainers and substance use disorder. So thanks for coming in and talking with me today. Thank you, Lisa. It's a pleasure to be here. Happy to be here. So I should say that Nick is one of my favorite people in the world and that he and I used to work closely together when I also was employed by this health system. And I've missed you very much. So not only am I happy that you're here to talk about this topic, but it's really good to see you again. Same to you. And I would say the same about you, Lisa. One of my favorites. What's fun about you and I both is that we're both from Maine. We both kind of grew up and stayed in the community, kind of went away, came back. But you have an interesting backstory with our health system. And that is that you actually worked there long before you actually became the medical director of the service line. Mm -hmm. And in fact, did you also have family that worked there? Yeah, I did. So I, I mean, I grew up in Winslow, so a small town in Maine. And uh, um, being from that area, you know, the, the health system um, there was a ma major employer of, of uh, many people living in that area. And, and I did have, you know, generations of my family that worked there, including my grandmothers. And, um, and then my, my mom actually worked for, um, for them for 40-ish years or so as well. So um, I did start working um, um, at the hospital when I was about, I'd say 15 or 16, I started in um, environmental services, you know, cleaning, essentially, um, doing floor, floors and emptying trash cans and things like that, and um, sort of worked my way through high school doing that. And, um, and then when I got into college, I went to, um, I started at University of Maine in Augusta. And uh, so sort of stayed in the area and, and um, lived off campus and, and worked to sort of support myself through college and stayed with the hospital, which I, um, you know, I've really enjoyed you know working there and it's a great it's a great community there so uh and then after following college i did my med school in maine as well so you know spent most of my life in maine and um i following med school did my emergency medicine residency in new york and then i uh, got interested in in the practice of addiction medicine there and and then went to uh brown in rhode island for my uh, addiction fellowship and to be honest wasn't really thinking about I guess wasn't definitely planning to come back to Maine, but sort of everything sort of aligned, you know, at the time when I was trying to find the right uh, place for myself and my family and what job I was going to do. And, and uh, the stars just aligned and ended up coming back here, which I'm very happy about. And I, I think you have the distinction of probably being the only physician on staff who used to be the one who was emptying the trash in making sure the floors were clean. Definitely. So, so you really know the place from inside out, up and down. Yep. You've, you've connected with a lot of people who work at Maine General, but also you've been really connected to the people in the community for a very, very long time. Yes. And I, I'll tell you a quick funny story that um, when I first started here, my first boss when I was here was somebody whose office I used to clean when I was in high school. So it was kind of a, a funny situation when I, when I first came and uh, found out who my I was going to be reporting to as a physician and happened to be uh, one of the doctors that I used to clean his office. So it was a funny story between he and I initially. And hopefully he didn't create too much work on the cleaning side for you. No, no, he was, good. You he was one of the He was one of the low maintenance ones. <laughs> That's good to know. And you also, for a while, I believe, wasn't your brother also uh, in the law enforcement yeah. um, in the local area for many years? Yeah, so my brother actually worked for um, the same healthcare system as well, doing sort of the same work when he was in high school and then uh, went off to college and came back uh, and started his family here in the area. And he was a, a, a cop as well um, in, in the community for three or four years. He recently moved actually to Florida to take on a different um, job, but he and his family moved recently. But yeah, so we've been sort of 
uh, part of this area for, for our whole lives, really. When I think about emergency medicine and substance use disorder, which is still being called within the field, it's still being called addiction medicine, mm-hmm. but we, we acknowledge that it's called substance use disorder. Um, those two service lines, both of which I was very actively involved in in that organization when I worked there with you, um, they're somewhat stressful. They're stressful. Their patients are coming in in a moment in their lives or their family members' lives where it's really high need, where they really identify that there are changes that need to be made, whether you're in the emergency department and there's something that's happening acutely, or in the case of substance use disorder, you have recognized you're at a place where you need to do things differently moving forward, and somehow that attracted you. Mm-hmm. So, so talk to me talk to me about that. That is not something that attracts every person. Before I went to, to medical school, I did, I did go with the goal of being an emergency medicine doctor. I can't actually remember where that interest first came to me, but I know I've always been somebody who's um, I like to multitask. I kind of like to be up and around, moving around and doing many different things. Um, and so I think naturally I kind of gravitated towards that, but really I, I uh, got introduced to um, the environment of emergency medicine when I was working for the hospital, not as a physician. It was when I was spending time there, I was like, this place is really interesting. There's this energy here. Uh, there's a lot going on. And just being an observer of that, um, I was, I saw a lot of interesting things and I was like, man, I really want to know what's going on here, you know? And, um, so I really actually found myself to be sort of attracted to that environment. It was like a different, you walk in there and there's like a buzz to it. It's different than, than walking around other areas of the hospital. And I was just attracted to that, um, area. And luckily I, I met, um, somebody who I still consider to be a a mentor of mine, one of my closest people uh, in my life. And he's an ER doc and he, he would actually let me follow him around. He, I would come in when I wasn't working and he would let me kind of follow him around. He would show me around and let me see some cases. And I still remember some, um, he would introduce me as like a pre-medical student, even though I was like in college and a different, I actually went to music school for, for college. So I, I, uh, was not even doing a science at the time. And, um, so my, the trajectory was a little uncommon, I would say, but, uh, but so he would introduce me as like a pre-medical student and, and allow me to kind of see some cases with him, interesting cases. And I still remember some of them actually that I saw, and this was, you know, maybe 10, 12, 15 years ago, you know, I still remember some specific cases. It had a really big impact on me. I did waver a little bit in medical school, as you probably remember. It's like you kind of go in with with this thought about what it's going to be like or what any specialty is going to be like. And there's sort of the ability to be have some glamour for you to create some glamour about what you think it's going to be like. And then the the nice thing about med school when you do your rotations is you get to go and try everything out. And there were certain times when I was like, maybe I want to do this or maybe I want to do that. But really, at the end of the day, I... Um, I stuck with emergency medicine, so and was lucky enough to do my residency training in that, and a really, really good program. But throughout the course of that, this was in 20, 2015 was when I started. So, and, and I say that because sort of the timeline of of where things have gone with substance use disorder. You know, like the late '90s, we started to see um, a lot of the issues with prescriptions of opioids and and like the changing environment on what what is pain and what should anybody have to deal with and what medication should be prescribed and things. And and so I think that, um, you know, early 2000s, things were kind of getting really bad, but I was I was in high school and I didn't really have any um, experience with it myself. Luckily, luckily enough, I didn't have any se- severe injury or anything. Um, at that time, but my first real exposure to it in the real world was in residency. And we, all of a sudden we started seeing all these people coming in with the time. It was usually, it was mostly heroin um, and uh, and pe- um, prescription pain medicine and people were just suffering and, and really just um, not doing well. And um, some of the, and from all different walks of life too, that's one thing I, I learned pretty quickly is that there isn't, you can't really lump uh, this sort of disorder or disease process into like a certain population of people. It's really, uh, it hits everybody and anybody. And um, some people are just lucky that it didn't hit them, you know. And so I sort of learned that there and and uh, um, and we were seeing it so much. And 
Um, to me, it was, I thought it was unique to that area because it was my own personal experience. I'd never seen it before. And I'm like, man, this area has a real big problem and come to find out, you know, everybody has a really big problem. Um, and, uh, and then, so I, I sort of got in, interested in, in, um, the process, the disease process and what, what was causing it and why, um, this was happening to so many people. And I did find that from the emergency department, we were able to, to create some, um, processes and procedures, myself and a couple of other residents who were interested in it to help streamline the process of like assessing, um, particularly what I'm, I'm speaking of is acute opioid withdrawal is usually what we would see, um, more, more than anything else. And we would, we created some processes to be able to manage that and, and, um, take care of folks quickly and then also get them, um, connected to an outpatient place, like so they could leave our ER and go there. And I just saw that the impact of that was huge. And it was like, it was different than what the impact that I felt as an ER doc who would like kind of patch things up and move on, you know? And then I, I was, I would find myself getting a little more involved in these cases and wanting to like know what happened to them and where they went and, and all this kind of stuff, more long-term things that I never thought I would would be part of my medical practice, I guess. So it kind of found me in a way. Um, and then I, we, we quickly find, found out that we didn't have enough resources in the community to care for all the people that we were seeing in the ER. So that was another issue. So then I started working at, um, at the uh, local um, practice that we were sending people to um, from the ED, and I would see them outside of the ER. So that's sort of how I, I got this sort of continuity of care um, piece that I wasn't getting from the ER either. And, and, um, just seeing, being able to be involved and help, help folks in the little way that I could and see the huge impact that just having a little bit of help made for them in their life was very impactful for me. Um, and sort of sparked my interest to do this more regularly. One of the things that I know you and I have talked quite a bit about is the importance of moving beyond bias because I do think that when you think about addiction and people still will use terms like addict and alcoholic and as if, you know, somebody is that, that, that is their identity. And what you're describing is this is an individual who is using substances and is disordered in the way that they use substances. And I think that that's truly important because it's very similar to say, you know, somebody who is, who is a diabetic you know, it's actually a person who has diabetes. And I think we need to be thinking about the fact that these are people, like all of us are people, and they happen to have this specific type of disease process. And if we keep thinking about them as somehow separate from us and being biased to, toward this idea that they are addicts and alcoholics, that othering of them isn't really productive for them. It's not productive for our society. And it doesn't enable them to get the help they need. I mean, it's pretty staggering if you if you look at um, the amount of people that have substance use disorder or that would be diagnosed with a substance use disorder. You know, there's a lot of studies now when they're looking at um, the numbers of people and it's the numbers are staggering. I mean, and it, it, one of the comparing them to other chronic diseases um, like diabetes or, or um, high blood pressure or things like that, it the numbers are right up there in terms of how many people have substance use disorder. Um, as compared to some of these other disease processes that we sort of know of in America as like the chronic diseases that we we manage. Um, and I think one of the reasons is because um, actually with substance use disorder, it affects younger people too. So like heart disease and diabetes. Diabetes is a little different. It's a wider age range, but like cancer, um, heart disease and those things, they, they're sort of more common in the older um, population as opposed to like substance use disorder, which is in those folks and even kids as, as young as 12, you know, it's getting younger and younger. So it's, it's a larger population of people um, overall in terms of the age range that it spans. Um, and uh, there's, you know, more and more there's um, research and um, studies and, uh, you know, with advanced advance of imaging and things like we, the, it, it has been really proven that it, it's a it's a disease process of the brain and and it affects the body as well. So it it has real identifiable physiologic changes like other diseases. And um, I think 
the thing that really uh, sort of um, showed, really displayed to me um, how the this, or solidified to me, I should say, maybe the the um, chronic disease model of of addiction is when, and it's still to this day. Every time I sit down with somebody, when I hear what happened, when I hear. If, if you sit down with somebody who has, um, who is a alcoholic or a, or an addict or whatever you want to want to say about it, um, if you sit down with them and you talk to them about what happened, how did, how did this happen, um, you're gonna find that it, uh, that it's really it's some of the stuff that that leads to the the um, development of a substance use disorder is just awful, and um, people growing up in um, families where you know, they really didn't have a chance. A lot of them are exposed to this at an early age. Um, and and there's always that sort of nature versus nurture, environment versus genetics um, discussion with most diseases. But if you look at even diabetes, you know, if you have parents with diabetes, you're way more likely to have it. So, but that that's just one little piece. Now, if you have grow up in a family with parents who are diabetics, how does that also affect the food that's in the home? Um, the uh, thoughts about exercise and physical activity. Um, what is the socioeconomic status? Like, are people actually able to buy fruits and vegetables? Like, there's this whole big thing underneath that. Um, any person that has any kind of medical condition, there's a there's a big picture underneath. And I think it's been a lot. I think maybe um, substance use disorder and like the carnage that it's caused is really disturbing. And sometimes it's easier to separate ourselves from that in a way where we don't identify them as people who have gone through a lot of stuff that led them to there. And I, and when I'm sitting across my desk from somebody, you know, I often have the thought that if I had gone through that, I would be on the other side of the desk right now. So like, it's just by luck and sheer, I don't know what, what you want to say that I'm not over there, you know, and, and I, that I've learned that and it's really, um, it's really impacted how I interact with, with folks that I see. And, and it just has given me a greater understanding of the disease process. And I think that's really lacking in, in society as a whole. Um, not because I think people don't care in general. It's just, it's just a sort of a developing philosophy. You know, it's, it's a new philosophy, whereas even 10, 20 years ago, it was like a moral failing, a weakness, that sort of thing. Like what's wrong with them? Why can't they just pull themselves up? Um, but the more we we um, dig into this, the more we can see that there's really it's a just a lar a big picture thing that and this is like a symptom of of a lot of things that have happened to people in their life to get them there. I, I like the idea that you're calling it a developing philosophy because then we're we're not necessarily saying to people who have had a different philosophy in the past like oh you're wrong and you're bad for having that because then you're just othering that group of people for that understanding at that time. We have new information. We're developing a new understanding. We're moving forward with this new understanding, and it's and everybody's going to adopt this new understanding at different times. Mm -hmm. I, I think the other thing that you have said more than once that captures my interest is the fact that this really it not only can happen to anyone; it does happen to everyone across every socioeconomic stratification. Yes, it may be more likely to happen p with people who are adversely impacted by specific social determinants of health and trauma. And also, it impacts people who grew up in relatively straightforward homes with not as much trauma. And th these are people that work alongside us. These are people, these are our brothers and sisters and our aunts and uncles and our grandparents. And they're there. It's just that they end up being kind of rendered invisible because maybe we can't see them. Maybe we don't want to see them. Maybe they don't want us to see them because there's such shame associated with this. So for me, that's, that's the thing that I, it, it chills me when I think about that, actually, this idea that somebody feels so much shame around having this specific diagnosis that they wouldn't want me to know about it as a family member or a friend or a colleague. That's the term right there is, is shame. You know, I have this conversation quite frequently with many of the patients that I see and I'm just sort of every day just floored and sort of in awe of people that I have the pleasure of sort of, I say, taking care of, but really they're doing all the hard work. Like I'm doing, what I do is 
I'm doing the easy stuff. They're doing all the hard stuff. You know, they leave and then they have to go and be in the world. And, and the amount of determination and will and just dedication that I see in these, these patients is like, it's just overwhelming. And it's, I'm, I'm constantly in awe of, of what they do. And if you just think about any behavior change that you've ever tried to make, like, I'm going to be less annoyed, but that's hard. You know, if, if you like, even just driving down the road, like my goal today is I'm just not going to get mad at anybody who's driving five miles an hour under the speed limit, see how long you can go, you know, and it takes a long time and like a really determined effort just to make little changes. But then you, you think about somebody who, who's, whole life has sort of been um, changed by the um, this disorder, this medical condition. And the I can tell you the the um, it's really the the amount of physical symptoms that people have is I mean you think about the worst flu you've ever had, multiply that by 10 and that's how somebody feels one day into trying to make this change. And it's and it's, it's whether it's opioids or even alcohol, you know, it's, it's really, um, you take sort of human behavior and how hard it is for anybody to make even a simple change because of habit, you know, and, uh, and then you add on this whole component of physical dependence, um, illness that this causes. And also, um, over time, your life sort of, uh, becomes one that facilitates your substance use. So, not only are you trying to deal with the emotional and physical aspects of things, you're also more likely to continuously be exposed to that environment where, where um, substance use is offered, is encouraged, like people encouraging you to continue. And, um, and that's where like sort of this whole shame thing that you, you mentioned, that's just one of, one of the places where it comes into play is that, um, you know, people don't in some ways don't feel like they deserve help. And so they try to do it on their own and they try to, and they have to sort of be continuously surrounded by um, this environment that they've been in before, because going out into the general population and saying, I have a drug use problem or I have an alcohol use problem is not really that welcoming. And in our society, it's just not something that is um, people feel welcome to do. And it's, it hurts me to think about because of when I see some of these folks that go through so many hard things to, to rebuild their life, you know, and it, sometimes it takes years and years of, of hard work and dedication and sacrifice and everything to get to a better place um, and to be in recovery for the long term. And they don't even want to tell anyone. And I'm like, you are a all star. Like you're you're just a like I can't even tell you how like how awesome you are and like how big what you did is and like you don't even want to tell anybody and I want to like get a banner and uh celebrate their you know their efforts and stuff and and even after all that that they've been through which nobody will ever know like most people won't ever know um and they still don't feel they still feel like they have to be in in hiding like they were when they were in substance use disorder like even in recovery they're hiding their recovery you know what I mean and and uh I think part of that is just the way it's viewed in society um, and, and that it's just not something that we, we recognize as, a, as an achievement. And, I, and I, I think that's changing. You know, it's um, like you said, it's developing, it's changing. Um, and I think with the more we talk about it, the more education there is out there, the more that's going to change and people will see. We'll see that. But I get the luxury of seeing what happens after years of work and not giving up on people, riding through the ups and downs of it, and then seeing what, where they come on the other side. And most people don't get to see that. So I do have sort of a biased view in, in, in a good way, I would say, because I, I do see that. And then I can speak about it. I think you're so right about being able to give people credit for remaining in recovery, because it is something that it doesn't ever go away. I mean, that's the thing. It's 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 similar to um, people who have HIV. That will always be with them. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've now come to a place where HIV is not in and of itself a death sentence, which is not the way it was, you know, back when it was first diagnosed and back when I first came into medicine. Um, but substance use disorder is very similar, that this is something that will be with somebody 
for the rest of their life, like diabetes. Mm -hmm. You know, like people who have diabetes who are on insulin, they will never stop taking insulin. Yeah. People who have substance use disorder who who need to maybe have maintenance medication, or even if they don't need maintenance medication, they're still going to wake up and they're going to say, oh, I, I could go back and use the substance, substance yeah. again. Or they might get triggered and they might really feel like they need to self-medicate. So that ability to give them credit, it, it feels like what we do with people who have cancer. Like, good job, you know, you've made it through. This is so amazing. And we do that with people who have cancer. So could we could we start being more open to actually supporting people similarly who have substance use disorder? I hope so. <laughs> I, would, I would love that. You know, um, it is a big achievement. And I think just... Um, I can't really, it's hard for me to describe the amount of work and time and effort that it takes. Um, and um, even, you know, being a, I can tell you just being a, a provider, somebody who who takes care of these folks, um, there isn't, when you look at other chronic diseases like diabetes and hypertension and, and things like that, um, the treatment availability is much more robust. It's not hard to go if you're like, oh, I have high blood pressure saying that you, you have a primary care, you know, you have access to some some sort of, or the ability to, to get access to that, um, which isn't easy. I'm not saying it, even in, in this um, day and age, it's not always easy to get access to a regular provider. But um, but if you do, you can, pr you can be pretty sure that they're going to help you with those sort of things like diabetes and hypertension. Um, but with substance use disorder, it's not le necessarily like that. Not everybody does that. Um, and so the not everybody treats it. Not everybody sort of um, wants that to be part of their practice, I would say. And and so um, the access to care, when you look at why, you know, the growing numbers of people with diagnosis of substance use disorder and, um, and the o overdose deaths and things, and one of the major conversations is access to care, access to care. There's just not a lot of access to care. And I can say, you know, um, this the program that we've been developing over the last three years here in Central Maine. Um, one of the biggest challenges is um, because of uh, this disease really does impact everybody from every walk of life. It's it's really a challenge sometimes to figure out how to make policies and procedures with a program that encompasses when you see a um, somebody who has a car who can drive there, and then an hour later you're seeing somebody who's homeless. So it's even creating policies and procedures of like um, attendance policies or or tardiness policies or or how often do I need to see people? It really is difficult because of the wide range of of abilities and sort of where people are coming from. So I'm a very strong believer in in individualized care. So I I I try to spend as much time with everybody that I see, and and it's sort of our philosophy is that. Everyone's totally different and their disease, although the, the process, like the physiologic process can be explained and pretty well now with um, uh, all the studies that we have done and, and our advances in, in um, medical knowledge, like we kind of know a lot about the brain and how this process works, but that's only a little piece of, of the thing. Um, the, the entire process, the disease process in general is, is really uh, an individual thing. So somebody who, like I said, has a home and a car is going to be much different. And, and in some ways, the treatment regimen and the, the way that we approach them or, or how we uh, set up a treatment program for over the long term for somebody who has resources and, a, and family support is going to be different than the person we see next who, who walks to our office with no shoes on in the winter. Um, and we do see that range of people on a daily basis. So, um, so individualized care. So that's, that's one of the, the, it is a difficult illness to manage. So, it, so it is, um, I think that is another reason why access to care is just not, um, not as readily available because it's hard to set up programs like at a primary care office that can accommodate that wide range of people's abilities and, and, um, and resources and things like that. So where, where we're at, we have a, the luxury of that's what we do, like that's who we take care of. So we're able to do that. And, I, you know, we're able to create uh, policies that, that allow us to really care for each person individually and, and welcome people from sort of all walks of life, which is what, 
who has this illness. So, and that's an important thing if you're, you know, if you're trying to treat people, you don't want to, I don't ever want to lose anybody. I don't ever want to not, I have a program that doesn't, is not set up to help somebody because of where they're at in life, you know? Um, and so we, that keeps it very interesting for us too, because we're always, every year we kind of reviewing how we're doing things and changing things here and there over the last three years. Um, when we find like little loopholes or things we could be doing better, you know, to just could keep everybody in the practice to, to welcome as many people as we can and care for as many people as we can. One of the other things that, I mean, you've identified, there's so many challenges that are, that you've identified and, you know, this is a conversation you and I could have. We could have 12 shows and we could still be talking about this. But I think one of the things I want to close on is also this idea that in addition to all the things we've mentioned, where you, whether you're talking alcohol use disorder or opioid use disorder, um, we also have ones that are coming into the picture. We now have stimulant use disorder, for example, and people who have been maybe taking stimulants for treatment of their very um, significant ADHD or ADD, um, they've been appropriately using these medications, but not everybody is appropriately using these medications. We now have things being introduced into things like fentanyl that are being introduced into um, the street drugs that are out there. So, I mean, that's the other interesting challenge that I see that somebody like you, but really everybody in medicine is dealing with is what we thought of when we thought about addiction medicine, and I'm putting air quotes around it, mm -hmm. and now calling substance use disorder. It's not even what it's going to be in 10 years is not even what it was 10 years ago. No. And that's, that's very, very accurate. And I, and I've only, I haven't been doing this for too, too long, but I've seen it change so much since 2015 when I, when, you know, after I got out of medical school and started my training. So nine years has changed a lot. you know, there wasn't even, fentanyl wasn't even a thing back in, in 2015. And now um, that is the predominant substance that I see. And I look at hundreds of drug screens a month and um, heroin is almost non-existent. You know, it's, it's all fentanyl and, uh, and it's even being mixed into other drugs. So, you know, people are buying um, drugs not intending to use fentanyl and they're getting exposed to it. And that's, I've seen cause a lot of uh, problems too. So there's that, you know, thing we kind of call harm reduction as well, which is sort of like um, we, which we approach most patients from that sort of um, mindset as well is, is really um, looking at the whole picture and trying to figure out ways that we can um, talk to people about the risks of their behavior um, and minimize those risks as much as possible while also knowing that we're not going to make them stop. We're not going to make behavior change by like forcefully trying to do that. So um, so what, what you're saying is very relevant in that um, it's one of those things we're always talking to people about, even who aren't using um, intentionally using things like opioids. Um, that they're getting exposed to it. And that's really dangerous. And you can see that in the um, sort of overdose deaths. They're, they're just astronomical, you know, like just a lot of people are dying still. And um, so it's a dangerous world out there. And it's a little like, I mean, not to be dramatic, but I kind of say it's, it's a little like Russian roulette when you use drugs on the street now, um, because you just don't know what you're getting exposed to. So so that is an important aspect, in my opinion, is is really talking to patients about that, even if they're not using opioids in general that are going to lead, that are going to put them at high risk for like immediate overdose. Um, but it's mixed in with the stimulants, it's mixed in with all these other things too. So, um, and I'm hope you know, um, so we, we do see that as well. Like we do see co things like cocaine and other prescription stimulants. Um, and it's becoming a little more, uh, common, but still most, most of what we're seeing is, um, is the fentanyl and, um, and that's just the da most dangerous in the short term, um, drug that people are getting exposed to. So, um, we're trying to look at it from the big picture perspective as well and really try to reduce as much harm as we can. Well, again, I feel like we're just scratching the surface here. 
So maybe we'll have to have you come back again and talk about this. But I really appreciate you taking the time out of your extremely busy schedule to come all the way down here. Thanks. I'm so happy to do it. It's awesome. Thank you. I've been speaking with Dr. Nick Gallagher. He is the medical director with Addiction Medicine for one of our local health um, service organizations. He's somebody that I used to work with, and I really appreciate all the work that um, he does on a daily basis with people in our community who are suffering from substance use disorder. I'm Dr. Lisa Belial. You've been listening to or watching our video podcast, Radio Maine, where we explore and celebrate creativity and the human spirit. Certainly, I believe that uh, Nick is somebody who also is celebrating the human spirit and doing his part to make sure that we continue to move forward in a positive direction with this really important problem that we've been dealing with. Nick, it's been great to have you here today. Great to be here. Thanks so much.